everyone, I'm Miss Mary Beth. I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Ingalls Memorial Library and Ringe. And I'm here today for Armchair Adventures. And that's our series where every day I read a little bit of a book to you and eventually we finish a whole book together. And the book we're reading right now is The Princess and the Goblin. And we're almost done with it. We're so close to finishing. It's a pretty exciting book because a lot has happened. Our Princess Arbeen lives in a kingdom where goblins live in the mines below the castle. The goblins don't like the royal family. And this is our friend Curdy, who is a miner who works in the mines. And he found out that there's a plot against the royal family to take the Princess Irene and force her to marry the Prince of the Goblins. And Irene's only eight. She doesn't know that. But so she's asleep in her castle, and Curdy was accidentally injured by the soldiers that are watching Irene's castle. So Curdy is in the castle and is in a little bit of a feverish state. And he keeps telling the soldiers crazy things like the goblins are coming. The soldiers don't believe him. But the goblins are coming. The goblins worked in the mines and, and dug out a tunnel that leads to the king's wine cellars. And that was where we left off. They finally broke through the rock wall and are in the king's castle. <gasps> so let's find out what happens. And this is chapter 27. The goblins in the king's house. When Curdy fell asleep, he began at once to dream. He thought he was ascending the mountainside from the mouth of the mine, whistling and singing, Ring, dod, bang! When he came upon a woman and child who had lost their way. And from that point on, he went on dreaming that everything that had happened to him since he, he, mess he first met the princess and her nurse, Ludi, how he had watched the goblins, how he had been taken by them, and how he had been rescued by the princess. He dreamed of everything indeed, until he was wounded, captured, and imprisoned by the men-at-arms. And now he thought he was lying wide awake where they had laid him, when suddenly he heard a great thundering sound. The goblins are coming, he said. They didn't believe a word I told them. The goblins will be carrying off the princess from under their noses. <gasps> but they shan't! They shan't! Curdy jumped up, as he thought, and he began to get dressed. But, to his dismay, he found that he was still lying in bed. He has a fever, remember. Now then, I will, I will! Here he goes! I am up now! But yet again, he found himself snug in bed. Twenty times he tried, and twenty times he failed. For in fact, he was not actually awake. He was only dreaming that he was awake. At length, in an agony of despair, fancying he heard the goblins all over the house, he gave a great cry. Then there came, as he thought, a hand upon the lock of the door. The door opened, and looking up, he saw a lady with white hair, carrying a silver box in her hand. And she entered the room. She came to his bed, he thought, and stroked his head with a fa and face with a cool, soft hand. And he, she took the dressing from his leg, rubbed it with something that smelled like roses, and waved her hands over him three times. At the last wave of her hands, everything vanished, and he felt himself sinking into the profoundest slumber, and remembered nothing more until he woke awake, until he awoke in earnest. <gasps> who was the lady who entered his room? I think we know. Is it Irene's grandmother? I think so. The, settle, the setting moon was throwing a feeble light through the casement, and the house was full of uproar. There was soft, heavy, multitudinous stamping, a clashing and clanging of weapons, the voices of men and the cries of women, mixed with a hideous bellowing, which sounded victorious. The cobs were in the house! He sprang from his bed, hurried on some, some of his clothes, not forgetting his shoes, which were armed with nails, and then, spying an old hunting knife, or short sword, hanging on the walls, he took it, and he rushed down the stairs, guided by the sounds of strife which grew louder and louder. When Curdy reached the ground floor, he heard the whole. He found the whole place swarming. All the goblins of the mountain seemed gathered there. He rushed among the goblins, shouting, One, two, hit and hew! Three, four, bass and boar! Remember, the goblins don't like singing. With every rhyme, he came down a great stamp upon a foot, cutting at the same time their faces, executing, indeed, a sword dance of the wildest description. Away scattered the goblins in every direction, into closets, upstairs, into chimneys, up on rafters, and down to the cellars. Curdy went on stamping and slashing and singing, but he saw nothing of the people of the house until he came to a great hall, in which, the moment he entered it, arose a great goblin shout. The last of the men-at-arms, the captain himself, was on the floor, buried beneath a huge crowd of goblins. For, while each knight was busy defending himself as well he could, by stabs in the thick bodies of the goblins, for he had soon found their heads all but invulnerable. The queen had attacked his legs and feet with her horrible granite shoe, and he was down. But the captain has got his back to the wall, and he stood out longer. The goblins would have torn them all to pieces, 
but the king had given orders to carry them away alive, and over each of them, in twelve groups, was standing a knot of goblins, while as many it could find room were sitting upon them. Curdie burst in dancing and, and stamping and singing like a small incarnate whirl whirlwind. Where tis all a hole, sir, and never can be holes. Why should their shoes have soles, sir, when they've got no soles? The queen gave a howl of rage and dismay, and before she recovered her presence of mind, Curdie, having begun with the group nearest him, had eleven of the knights on their legs again. Good job, Curdie! Stamp on their feet, he cried, as each man rose, and in a few minutes the hall was nearly empty, the goblins running from it as fast as they could howling and shrieking and limping and cowering every now and then as they ran to the cuddle their wounded feet in their hard hands or to protect them from the frightful stamping of the armed men's shoes. And now Curdie approached the group which, in trusting, the queen had, in trusting in the queen and her shoe, kept their guard over the captain. The king sat on the captain's head, but the goblin queen stood in front like an infuriated cat, with her perpendicular eyes gleaming green and her hair standing half up from her horrid head. Her heart was shaking, however, and she kept moving about her skin-shod foot with nervous apprehension. When, it, when Curdie was within a few paces, the Goblin Queen rushed at him and made one tremendous stamp at his foot, which he happily withdrew in time, and he caught him round the waist and to dash him on the marble floor. But just as she caught Curdie, he came down with all the weight of his iron-shod shoe upon her, and with a hideous howl she dropped him, squatted on the floor, and took her foot in both hands. Meanwhile, the rest rushed on the king and the bodyguard, sent them flying, and lifted the captain, who was all but pressed. It was some moments before the captain recovered breath and consciousness. Where's the princess? cried Curdie again and again. No one knew, and they all rushed off in search of her. Though every through every room in the house they went, but no one knew where nowhere was she to be found. Neither was one of the servants to be seen. But Curdie, who had kept to the lower part of the house, which was now quiet enough, began to hear a confused sound as of a distant hubbub and set out to find where it came from. The noise grew as his sharp ears guided him to a stair, and so to the wine cellar. It was full of goblins, whom the butler was supposed supplying with wine as fast as he could draw it. Huh. While the queen and her party had encountered the men-at-arms, Harelip with another company had gone off to search the house. Remember, Harelip is the goblin prince. They captured everyone they met, and when they could find no more, they hurried away to carry them safe to the caverns below. But when the butler, who was among them, found that their path lay through the wine cellar, he thought to himself of persuading them to taste the wine. And, as he had hoped, they no sooner tasted the wine than they wanted more. The goblins, on their way below, joined them, and when Curdie entered they were all, with outstretched hands, in which were vessels of every description, from saucepan to silver cup, they were pressing around the butler, who sat at the tap of a huge cask of wine, filling and filling their goblets. Curdie cast one glance around the place before commencing his attack, and saw in the farthest corner a terrified group of domestics unwatched, but carrying with courage, without courage to attempt their escape. Amongst them was the terror-stricken face of Ludie the nurse, but nowhere could he see the princess. Seized with the horrible conviction that Harelip had already carried her off, Curdie rushed among them, unable for wrath to sing any more, but stamping and cutting with greater fury than ever. Stamp on their feet! Stamp on their feet! he shouted and in a moment the goblins were disappearing through the hole in the floor. They could not vanish so fast, however, but that many more goblin feet had to go limping back over the underground ways of the mountain that morning. Presently, however, they were reinforced from above by the king and his party, with the, king at their head, with the queen at their head. Finding Curdie again busy amongst her unfortunate subjects, the goblin queen rushed at him once more with the rage of despair. This time gave him a bad bruise on the foot. Then a regular stamping fight got out between them, and Curdie, with the point of his hunting knife, keeping her from clasping her mighty arms about him, as he watched his opportunity of getting once more a good stamp at her foot. But the queen was more wary as well, and more was more agile. The rest, meantime, finding their adversary thus matched for the moment, paused in their headlong hurry, and turned to the shivering group of women in the corner. As if determined to emulate his father and have a son woman of some sort to share his future throne, Harelip rushed at them, caught up Ludie and sped with her to the hole. She gave a great shriek, and Curdie heard her and saw the plight that she was in. Gathering all his strength, he gave the queen a sudden cut across the face with his weapon, came down as she stared back with all his weight on the proper foot, and he sprung to Ludie's rescue. The prince had two defenseless feet, and on both of them Curdie stamped just as he reached the hole. He dropped his burden and rolled shrieking into the earth. 
Curdy made one stab at him as he disappeared. He caught hold of the senseless Ludi, and having dragged her back to the corner, he mounted guard over her, preparing once more to encounter the queen. Her face was streaming with blood, and her eyes flashed green lightning through it. The queen came on with her mouth open and her teeth grinning like a tiger's, followed by the goblin king and her bodyguard of the thickest goblins. But the same moment in rushed the captain and his men, and they ran at them, stamping furiously. They dared not encounter such an onset. Away they scurried, the goblin queen foremost. Of course, the right thing would have been to take the king and queen prisoners and hold them hostages for the princess, but they were so anxious to find her that no one thought of detaining them until it was too late. Having thus rescued the servants, they set about searching the house for the princess once more. None of them could give the least information concerning the princess. Ludi was almost silly with terror, and although scarcely able to walk, would not leave Curdie's side for a single moment. Again, he allowed the others to search the rest of the house, where, except a dismayed goblin lurking here and there, they found no one. Well, he requested Ludi to take him to the princess's room. There he found the bedclothes tossed about, and most of them on the floor, while the princess's garments were scattered all over the room, which was in the greatest confusion. It was only too evident that the goblins had been there, and Curdie no longer had any doubt that she had been carried off at the very first of the inroad. With a pang of despair, he saw how wrong they had been in not securing the king and queen and prince, but he was determined to find and rescue the princess, as she had found and rescued him, or meet the worst fate to which the goblins could doom him. And that was the end of chapter 27. Let's read another chapter for today. Chapter 28, Curdie's Guide. Just as the conclusion, just as the consolation of his, this resolve dawned upon Curdie, and he was turning away for the cellar to follow the goblins into their hole, something touched his hand. It was the slightest touch, and when he looked, he could see nothing. Feeling and peering about in the gray of the dawn, his fingers came upon a tight thread. He looked again, and narrowly, but still could see nothing. It flashed upon him that this must be the princess's thread. Without saying a word, for he knew no one would believe him, any more than he had believed the princess, he followed the thread with his finger, contrived to give Ludi the slip, and was soon out of the house on on the mountainside, surprised that, if the thread were indeed the grandmother's messenger, it should have led the princess into the mountain, where she would be certain to meet the goblins rushing back, enraged from their defeat. But Curdie hurried on in the hope of overtaking the princess. When he arrived, however, at the place where the path turned off for the mine, he found that the thread did not turn with it, but went straight up the mountain. Could it be that the thread was leading his home to him home to his mother's cottage? Could the princess be there? He bounded up the mountain like one of its own goats, and before the sun was up, the thread had brought him indeed to his mother's door. There it vanished from his fingers, and he could not find it, search as he might. The door was on the latch, and he entered. There sat his mother, asleep by the fire, and the princess lay in her arms. Hush, Curdie, said his mother when she woke. Do not wake the princess. I'm so glad you've come. I thought the goblins must have gotten you again. With a heart full of delight, Curdie sat down at a corner of the hearth on a stool opposite his mother's chair, and he gazed at the princess, who slept as peacefully as if she had been in her own bed. All at once she opened her eyes and fixed them upon him. Oh, Curdie, you've come, she said. I thought you would. Curdie rose and stood before her with downcast eyes. Irene, he said, I'm very sorry I did not believe you. Oh, never mind, Curdie, answered the princess. You couldn't, you know. You do believe me now, don't you? I can't help it now. I ought to have helped it before. Why can't you help it now? She asked. Because, just as I was going into the mountain to look for you, I got hold of your thread, and it brought me here. Then you've come from my house, have you? Yes, I have. I didn't know you were there, answered Irene. I've been there for two or three days, I think. I never knew it, answered Irene. Then perhaps you can tell me why my grandmother has brought me here. I can't think. Something woke me. I didn't know what, but I was frightened, and I felt for the thread, and there it was. I was more frightened still when it brought me out to the mountain, for I thought it was going to take me into it again, and I liked the outside of the mountain best. I suppose you were in trouble again, and I had to get you out, but it brought me here instead, and oh, Curdie, your mother has been so kind to me, just like my own grandmother. Here Curdie's mother gave the princess a hug, and the princess turned and gave her a sweet smile, and held up her mouth to kiss it to kiss her. Then you didn't see the goblins? asked Curdie. No, I haven't been into the mountain. I told you, Curdie. But the goblins have been in your house, all over it, and into your bedroom. What do they want there? It was very rude of them. They wanted you, said Curdie. They wanted to carry you off into the mountain, 
for you to make you a wife for their prince Harelip. <gasps> How dreadful, cried the princess. But you needn't be afraid, you know. Your grandmother takes care of you. <gasps> you do believe in my grandmother? I'm so glad she made me think you would someday. All at once, Curdie remembered his dream, and he was silent, thinking. But how did you come to be in my house, and how come I didn't know it? asked the princess. Then Curdie explained everything. How he had watched her for her sake, how he had been wounded and shut up by the soldiers, how he had heard the noises and could not rise, and how the beautiful old lady had come to him, and all that had followed. Poor Curdie, to lie there hurt and ill, and ne me never know it, exclaimed the princess. I would have come and nursed you if they had told me. I didn't see you were lame, said his mother. And my mother? Oh, yes, I suppose I ought to be. I declare I've never thought of it since I got up to go down amongst the coblins. Let me see the wound, said his mother. He pulled down his stocking. When behold, except for a great star, his scar, his leg was perfectly sound. Curdie and his mother gazed into each other's eyes, full of wonder. But Irene called out, I thought so, Curdie. I was sure it wasn't a dream. I was sure my grandmother had been to see you. Don't you smell the roses? It was my grandmother healed your leg and sent you to help me. No, Princess Irene, said Curdie. I wasn't good enough to be allowed to help you. I didn't believe you. Your grandmother took care of you without me. She sent you to help my people, anyhow. I wish my king papa would come. I do so want to tell him how good you've been. But, said Curdie's mother, we are forgetting how frightened your people must be. You must take the princess at home at once, Curdie. Or at least go and tell them where she is. Yes, mother. Only I'm dreadfully hungry. Do let me have some breakfast first. They ought to have listened to me, and then they wouldn't have been taken by surprise as they were. That's true, Curdie. But it's not true for you. It's not for you to blame them. Do you remember? Asked his mother. Yes, mother, I do. Only I really must have something to eat. You shall, my boy, as fast as I can get it, said his mother. But before breakfast was ready, Curdie jumped up so suddenly and he, just, he startled both of his companions. Mother, mother, he cried. I was forgetting. You must take the princess home yourself. I must go and wake my father. Without a word of explanation, he rushed to the place where the father was sleeping. Having thoroughly roused him with what he had told, he darted out of the cottage. And that is the end of chapter 28. I'm so glad they found Irene. Thank goodness for her grandmother. I'm so glad that they took care of the goblins and they found Irene. I'm glad Curdie was there. It would have been all for naught if it wasn't for Curdie. I think we have one more day left of the princess and the goblin. So thanks for reading with me, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow for Armchair Adventures. Have a fun day.